You're listening to the Zoe Turner Podcast. Business and mindset conversations that will help you move from fear and uncertainty to development and growth so that you can crush both life and business. Please welcome your host, Zoe Turner. Josh, as a long-standing fan of Tony Bazan and Jim Quick, it's fair to say that I'm fascinated with the brain and, you know, how it all works. From my personal experience, I embraced Tony Bazan from a really early age when I was 19, which was actually quite a long time ago. So that was in the day where it wasn't fashionable. These days, it's pretty fashionable. I found a Tony Bazan book in my school library, and I've actually still got it to this day. Amazing. I know. <laughs> like I, d- I never took it back. It's like one of the first editions of the Tony Bazan Use Your Head. I keep thinking that I'm going to take it back, but next time I go home <laughs> to the sleepy little seaside town, Amazing. I might take this book back. The like shameful 20 walk. 25 you know. years later. Amazing. Um, but yeah, that's when I was introduced to uh, Tony Bazan. So for those that don't know Josh, what is accelerated learning? So accelerated learning is in essence what it sounds like you accelerate the process of learning so there's if whatever skill you're trying to learn whatever you're trying to do and develop there's an easier and faster way to be able to develop those techniques so what um, Zoe was talking about with Zoe, uh, Tony Buzan is a process called mind mapping where you essentially have everything that's about a topic or a subject or anything and you put it out in a map in front of you that your brain creates and it's actually done in the same way that neurons create and uh, work in the brain so that's why mind mapping is so effective. You have a certain subject area and then it links in between like branches of a tree or something like that. And you have the leaves coming down that you can keep adding to and adding to and adding to to make your brain understand that process. So that's like one technique of accelerated learning. Uh, there's other ones that are various different mnemonics, which is what memory champions use to memorize thousands of digits or hundreds of names in a short period of time or decks of cards in 17 seconds or (laughs) whatever it sort of is there are different techniques to be able to learn and retain information so for me personally what I use it for is uh, I do different courses online so the last one I did was NLP which is neuro linguistics programming Um, and then I before I went to Mexico I learned 600 words in one week before I got there with 100% recall so that by the time I got to Mexico I could understand most of what was going on in a period of one week so it really depends on what your personal um, memory goals are. Mm, it's all so interesting and it fascinates me. I've just done a podcast with a lady on sleep, and I think this also ties into it as well because it's also you know it's about using it. This is like exercise for the brain. We exercise our body, but quite often we don't exercise our brain. Yeah, we actually do neglect that a lot. Um, so we we know that one third of memory is actually based on genes your genetics um the other two thirds are lifestyle so sleep actually plays a major factor in memory and so does your food exercise just health in general will affect your brain i know that if i have a couple of drinks or something like that you can start to forget little bits of the night or something like that where normally you'd have a much better memory or yeah depends on what you're doing it's all lifestyle based as well let's talk about mind mapping a little bit more because that is what i I (laughs) learned when, well, it was mind mapping and word association. When I went to university, I went to university when I was 24, and I'd sit in my lecture theatre, and I never used to write in linear form, because I really embraced this. I didn't just do, like, little mind maps. Mm. I did it elaborately. Like, I never, ever used to write in linear form. And apparently, our brain doesn't work in linear form like you say our our brain works in associations it's like the branch of a tree Mm -hmm. which is why tony bazan who is the proponent unfortunately he died he died last year i was so hoping to get him on the podcast um did i tell you about the personal message that i sent him no i don't think so so i had a gentleman we're going off track a little bit here but i was interviewing a guy called um mustafa hamway and he's the passionpreneur. You may have heard of him. Anyway, he was telling me about where he got his name from. And he said he was interviewing a guy called Professor Tony Bazan. <laughs> <laughs> I 
bearing in mind, yeah, bearing in mind that I don't think he expected me to be as um, like in awe. Because like Tony Bazan for me is like some people, you know, it's in like person. Tony Robbins for yeah, me. Yeah, some people adore Tony Robbins. Like for me, it was Tony Bazan. Like, Amazing. and I was like, oh my god, can you get him on the podcast? Um, and he was like, okay, I can try. And then I was like, do you have his mobile number? And he was like, yeah. And I was like, right, let's send him a personal message. So I videoed a personal message for Tony. I sounded like a gushing fan, but we sent it to him. And um, I never heard from Mustafa for like a week. And I kept thinking at the back of my mind, oh, I wonder if Tony's like read the message, you know. And then I messaged Mustafa probably about 10 days later. And I said, did Tony get back to you? And um, he was like, no, he, he didn't, but he's read the message. And then all these feelings of insecurity <laughs> came. And I was just thinking, oh, my God, oh did no. he think I was an idiot? Blah, my blah, idol doesn't blah. like me. Then a week <laughs> later, he I'd heard that he'd had a fall. And when he suffered from his fall, he had a heart attack. Oh, God. So that's the story. So I never got to get him on the podcast. Um, but Such a shame. But I, I'm really hoping he got to read my message before he died. Yeah, I hope so, too. Yeah. It's a shame, huh? So, let's talk a little bit about mind mapping. Sure. Um, so, <coughs> as I was saying, mind mapping is kind of like the way that neurons fire and work in between each other. Mm. So, it works through association. So, you can go from one point to another point and then connect another point to another point as soon as you have mm. the thoughts that, that connect in between. And so, the way that the brain works is when we're, say if you're taking notes via verbatim, mm. it's actually the worst way to take notes. Mm. The best way, uh, there's there's a few different ways to take notes, but one of the best ways is to literally you take keywords that then in your mind you can remember the keywords, which will then automatically recall the topic for you. So this similar th sort of thing with like what I do in um, memory palaces, or which we'll explain in a minute, <laughs> and uh, other forms of visual cues is you're creating a little marker, a checkpoint, so that when you go back to it, you can start to recall the information. So with a mind map, you don't need to have every single word listed out in front of you so that you can uh, try and recall all the information. You just need a little checkpoint, a little signpost, a little signpost, a little signpost <laughs> to then recall the information that's hidden or encoded inside of that yeah. space. Yeah, that's really interesting. It's interesting what you're saying about notes as well and how we're not supposed to be writing them word for word. That brings me back to a memory of when I was at school and uh, most teachers when I was at school just used to dictate. Yeah. And then we <laughs> would write it down. And I remember there was one guy in our class. So he'd be dictating and he'd be saying, on today's podcast, comma, yeah. Because um, that's where you'd have a comma. And, was wha and, and then he'd say full stop at the end of a sentence. Jeez. And one of the guys, I remember, you used to write the word comma. Oh, no <laughs> way. <laughs> and he used to write the word full stop. <laughs> so, you know, it just doesn't kind of encourage us to use our brains creatively. No, we're just following direction. And it, I guess <laughs> whilst we're laughing at this example, it's but really This is happening. This is consistent. That. That's the issue is I'm um, back in back in school. It's not personalized learning, which is accelerated learning. One of the main things that we teach is to, to make it personal because you can only remember what's associated in your brain. The way that anything works is via association. So when you start creating, uh, when you start in school, you're, you're reading all this dry, boring material. And the way that they teach is through rote repetition, which is just repeat, 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 until your brain finally submits and says, okay, fine, I get the information. Yeah. But then what we teach is how to make anything interesting and you use associations to represent the information. So if I'm doing something in mathematics or if it's, um, I was doing a, a bit of a law course for a bit, so... I would have all the main law terminologies as my favorite action heroes. Mm -hmm. And then they'd be doing certain actions or doing certain things. So then when they're doing that, that action or whatever it is, I can recall all the information from that thing. So I'm not even looking or thinking about what the information itself is. I'm creating an association and storylines based on my own, my own associations. So anything becomes personalized learning. And it's crazy how you actually can remember that. Yeah. Um, you know, I've done it. I did that when I was writing my essays at university for my exams. And um, I don't know if I shared with you, but at school, I never particularly excelled. I knew I, was, I wasn't I was thick, though, but yeah. I never really excelled at school. 
And, um, and it wasn't until I started studying the brain and I started studying kind of accelerated learning and all mm. these techniques just as I was going to university. And I remember, like, literally, like, I mean, I almost got a first. I say almost. I didn't. I got a 2-1. But this is someone that, you know, my mom didn't even want me to go to university. <laughs> she didn't think I was intelligent enough. Yeah. But just through using these techniques. And when I was sat in my exam and I was writing an essay, and we're talking about a really long essay here. I can't, look, I can't remember how many words an essay is. Um, but you just, I had these little elaborate stories in my head, like you have these superheroes, you know, and it, the story that you create or the picture, the visual image that you create in your mind could be completely different from the history essay yeah. that you're writing. But for in you it makes way, sense. It just makes it more exciting, but it makes sense. Yeah. And then the words just Flow. Yeah, it's insane, Such right? Such a more creative way of working and an, an interesting yeah. way of remembering things. Yeah. And um, I was also not the best student, I'll be completely honest. I skipped a lot of school because I really didn't enjoy it. Mm -hmm. I thought that I was a bad learner as well, to be honest. So when I was in school, I, w I got really, really bad marks. I was like D's and C's and stuff like that for most of high school. So I just didn't go a lot of the time as well. So then I thought that I was, I don't know, somehow challenged when it comes to learning. And... um. And I just had this conversation with my mom two, three days ago. She was like, who would have thought that you would be the one out there teaching people how to learn when I couldn't even get you to go to school? <laughs> it's fascinating, isn't it? And it's like Tony Bazan says, and I'm probably going to quote him a lot during this because he's it. like my idol, but it's all about knowing how to use your head. And I'll never forget the time that I first picked up his book and I read the back, the back of the book and it said how he can make you, you know, a C student into an A student. And he gave an example of somebody who was um, wanted to go to, I think it's either Oxford or Cambridge University, okay. which is one of the most prestigious universities in the UK. And you will only get in if you've got like A grades, like good A grades. And he wanted to go, but he was a C student with these techniques, knowing how to use his head he was able to get all the grades that he needed to go to this prestigious university. And I remember reading that and yeah, thinking, amazing, wow, yeah. if this is true, then I need to know how to do this. If you can do it, I can do it. Exactly. And that's when my journey started. It's amazing, actually. It's really cool that you discovered um, Tony at such a young age as well. So a lot of people just think that how your brain is is how your brain is. And mm -hmm. there's no changing that. So when we're in school, we're not taught how to learn, which is... In hindsight, ridiculous. It should be a prerequisite to any sort of learning. It should be, this is how you learn and retain and understand information. And this is how to use it. But it's never really happened in school. So that's like one of our main sort of issue, uh, main uh, visions for the future is to bring it globally into the schooling systems. Wow, that's incredible. Because <laughs> um, education is an area that I'm very, very passionate about. And, and like I say these techniques being taught in school, I think it would just be a complete game changer. I knew you were going for that word. I was like, yes, she used the <laughs> word game changer. <laughs> it would be a complete game changer yeah. for, um, for young people. Some of the things like um, we tell clients is, it's like having cheat notes, but inside your own head. Yeah. So um, there's a couple of the, the techniques that are, Sort of one of the most powerful ones that I personally use. It depends on what you like and what works best for you, but there are certain things that work really well for everybody. So um, if you think about what were you wearing two days ago? No idea. Try, try and remember. Try and remember what I was wearing two days ago. So talk me through the process. Where's your brain going right now? I'm just trying to remember i'm trying to think back like two days ago mm -hmm. what i was doing what day are we on today today is tuesday tuesday so two days ago was tuesday monday sunday i was working from home okay so i was probably wearing um yeah i think i was just wearing my shorts and t-shirt with no makeup cool so what you just did was um, exactly what I wanted you to do. So you started thinking about where was I? 
which is location, mm-hmm. one way the brain works. The second one was what was I doing, which is telling yourself a story about what was happening. And then the third one was what was I looking at or what did the area look like, which was images. So mm-hmm. picture, story, location. So that's essentially how the brain works in almost every area. <laughs> So then you can add different elements, like you can add in different uh, senses, like kinesthetic, auditory, uh, auditory, olfactory, gustatory, or visual, whatever you want, but it still works in the same sort of way, image, story, location. So there's one technique that we use called memory palace. And so it's literally, this room could be a memory palace. That door could be a, a place to store information. The barrel over there in the corner, which you can't see in the video, it could be used to store information or the table or whatever it is. So when I'm either recalling lots of numbers or I'm doing, um, I'm reading a book, I can turn all the main concepts of a picture of a of a chapter into different pictures, and then I can place them around my room, or my house, or wherever ever I am. So then when I start going around the room, I can think, oh, what was in this corner? Uh, that was this person doing these things, which represent this information. So I was reading a book called The Psychology of Persuasion. And for whatever reason, in Persuasion, Leonardo DiCaprio pops up in my mind. You know, in The Wolf of Wall Street. So he pops up in my mind. And then so he represents one chapter for me. And from that chapter, I can add a little cut on his forehead, which to me represents self-deprecation. So if you self-deprecate slightly, people start to trust you more. Because they don't have, they don't think you're trying to hide anything, right? So then you can also put him pointing into the future which for me means future pacing you imagine the future you imagine yourself from the future and the perspective and it's a very powerful persuasion technique and then how he's dressed his like presentation how he moves his proxemics so i can start to unwrap an entire chapter or more of information from one person one person and i can place him right there so then there's 10 points of a chapter right there in that spot and then i can just recall that at any point in time so then i walk to the next place in my room And who's there? For me, it could be the Hulk. It could be anybody. (laughs) And whatever information you put into that person then will be recalled because you just put, literally put the information into that person. So that's one powerful technique. And I can demonstrate it to you with numbers really quickly if you'd like. Yeah, I'd love to. Okay. So I want you to just, on your sheet of paper here, write down any two digit numbers. So just list them down. One, two, three, like that. Any two digits. Two digits. Could be like 21. It could be uh, how many numbers? It could be, I don't know, let's just do 10 for now. There's no perfect answer to this either. They're all supposed to be random. Okay, let me just have a chance to remember them. So for the people ah, there looking we go. at this on video, I'm just holding that up there for the people watching on YouTube. Just going to take a second. Okay, so we've got... Oh, you put another one at the top? Okay, you just confused me. Cool. Okay, I'll get it. One second. Almost there. <laughs> okay, we've got... Uh, okay, cool. You got it? Okay. So, do you want to have a look at it with me? So, I can look the other way. Okay. So, we should have one, two, three, two, five, eight, 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 uh, two, one, one, three, zero, one, seven, eight, seven, one. Perfect. Do you want it backwards? Yeah, do it backwards. <laughs> okay, so we've got one seven eight seven one zero three one one two eight 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 five two three two one. Wow, that's incredible. So that's one um, demonstration. That's only what we've only got uh, nine digit nine numbers there. Nine so numbers, yeah, yes. you could ask me what number six is, and I can tell you, for example, which is one three, or what number three is, which is five eight, or what number nine is, which is seven one, right? So like I can tell you based on location in my mind what number I'm looking at, 
and I'm actually turning every number into an image. Okay. So for me, there's a system called the major method, and so it turns every single number into a letter. And then you convert the letters, both the letters, into a word. So one, two for me would be uh, T and N, so tan. So I'd imagine just here, for example, somebody's tanning on a tan bed or something like that. Mm -hmm. So that's number one. And then number two, three, two would be man. So I'd imagine some big macho man over here in the corner. So mm -hmm. that's three, two. And then the next one would be love. I would imagine just a, a massive love heart there. Mm -hmm. And then so I can go, number one was one, two, three, two, five, eight, la, 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 all the way around. And then backwards, and then you've asked me what number one, three is. I go from here to here and I can find it. So that's a technique. I'm not remembering by photographic memory or some crazy thing, gifts that I've been given from birth. It's something that anybody can learn how to do. So it's using the same thing, picture, story, location, which you tried to find what you were wearing your clothes with before. Mm. <laughs> So there's certain ways that the brain works and there's ways to hijack that um, the way that it naturally works into creating long-term retentive information rather than just la, la, repeat, 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 right? Wow. I find it totally fascinating, totally fascinating just kind of listening to all of this. And um, these are techniques. Whilst the technique of the word association, I... I mm -hmm. I can relate to and I can remember that that's what I did. Yeah, and that's, a putting them in that's the one as well. Putting yeah. them in the different corners of the room, that's something that is totally new to me. Yeah, it's called a memory palace. It's actually ancient Greece techniques. So there was a guy called Simenides who was hosting a party and he left out, he went outside to make a phone call or something in ancient Greece. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, the whole room collapsed. So then people were crushed and killed at a table. It was like a long table like this. And people were asking, because they couldn't identify the bodies, so they were asking who was who. And you could only remember by looking at the, the place where they were sitting and the people that were sitting at that certain position. That's how I, he identified the people. So that was the birth of the memory palace, which is what I'm using here, but I'm storing information in a different sort of way. So it's not a new phenomenon. It's not a new it's technique. It's something that's been used for no. like centuries and centuries. Yeah. It's old, years old, and we're adapting yeah. it. Yeah. Wow, that's incredible. How could, this is all good and well, learning these numbers, but how how would they relate to our everyday life? What would be the advantages yeah. of that? So um, these sort of things, you don't necessarily need them. So remembering, recalling lots of numbers backwards and forwards, you don't really need it. It's more of a demonstration for me. However, the actual training process of it is it has carry-on effects. So even without me trying to show you how to use it for learning, it has an effect where it comes down to your creativity gets increased, your focus goes, your skyrockets, and then the way that you actually associate and find information in your brain, it starts to become faster and faster. So when I do this sort of stuff, I've noticed so many different areas of my life just improve naturally, which is a Pygmalion effect where you increase an area, the rest kind of comes up with it. So when I started doing it, I realized I could focus better in conversations. I could recall what was happening in conversations. And I wasn't even really trying to use techniques. Once you start using techniques for like deliberately and intently focusing or learning, then your retention just goes through the roof. And it's just, it makes, makes so much, it let my life so much easier when you just have your brain switched on and just working faster. <laughs> And you just start creating all this. By the way, it starts creating some really weird stuff in your mind. But you learn to start to not judge those things that just like randomly happen. Because You're thinking, oh my God, did I really think of that? Yeah, absolutely. That's crazy. But it's fine. It's like it's um, your brain just creates an association. You don't need to worry about what it is. If it pops up quickly, it means your brain will remember it faster. So try not to. It, it allows you to kind of almost take a meditative standpoint from it where you're the watcher, you know, you're observing your thoughts almost like that. So you start to realize how like in control of your brain and stuff as well you are, <laughs> which for me, I didn't expect either because I've done all like the power of now and so much meditation and everything like that. But it wasn't until I started doing this where I really started to notice it properly. And um, it's the whole creative side of this, which I think for so many children that are just dreamers, you know, can you imagine if they could learn about history or they could learn about science but they can 
having images that are going through their heads of their own like little superheroes like you do. Absolutely, yeah. It's just going to make it so much more interesting and enjoyable for them. Yeah, absolutely. We've actually had um, uh, a student that was doing really bad with math, did the same sort of thing, turned all this, um, all of the uh, the letters and everything in algebra into people. And then they were doing certain actions. And then he could remember what the formulas were. So he wasn't even remember the, remembering the formula. He was just remembering a scene in his own mind. And he was like, got out of the exams. Like, yep, nailed it. <laughs> so it doesn't matter what age you are. If you're six or if you're 80, you can still learn and benefit from these techniques and principles. Are you doing any talks in schools? Well, we're about to, but they're shut down for the next month. That's so That's correct. With the whole world's gone mad <laughs> with the coronavirus. The coronavirus. Yeah, so at the moment we're focusing more on doing uh, corporate training okay. and maybe also private workshops for sort of 10 to 20 people. Um, but the main thing we're going more into is the corporate trainings. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Really interesting. And I, c I imagine that it can really help with your listening skills as well. Absolutely. Which when you're engaging with someone on a one-to-one, -one, like so many people these days don't don't listen. You know, someone's talking and they're thinking of, what they're going to say next or sometimes you know when I'm giving a podcast someone's talking and I have to stop myself from thinking right what question am I going to ask next like engage yeah. really listen to what they're saying and I guess as I listen more to what you're saying and then maybe associate all these associations are going to come up anyway and it's going to be a more fluid conversation but plus it's enhancing your listening ability too, which means that you're going to be a more likable person. I guess. I think um, when you when you have the word listen, it's an also an anagram for the word silent. So when you're listening, if you're actually silent, then the person actually thinks you're more interesting. So when you actually just ask people questions and they speak about themselves, then you're actually more interesting to that person. So you're with accelerated learning, you're increasing your focus which allows you to be part of it and present through a conversation. But then when you also understand people are expressing their own learning style as they're speaking. So whenever you're talking to me, if you're saying something the way that you're saying it, it's just because that's how your brain is trying to figure it out. Not that you're trying to be better or anything like that. It's just like you're just you're using your own pri uh, previous experiences and associations <laughs> to be able to explain what how you're, um, how you're learning what I'm saying or how you're listening to what I'm saying. So when you start to get rid of the judgment in your head, you can actually start to listen a bit better as well. How how can this work benefit corporates? Depends on the corporate. So we generally tailor towards what um, what they need specifically. So if it's just people need to be able to learn names and faces better, then we can do that. Or if it's, um, I had one lady who wanted to remember her entire P&L statement which was 210 digits on a piece of paper. Um, and it's like 75 different numbers in different rows and columns, percentages, totals. She wants to remember every single one backwards and forwards in every sort of order, right? It'd be really good for public speaking too. And absolutely. presentations. Yeah, absolutely. Presentations are a big one actually. A lot of that's also like a fear of speaking for a lot of people. Mm. But other people want to be able to remember the entire speech like 15 minutes long. And there are techniques to be able to do that. Wow. So... Shakespeare actually used to teach uh, his actors how to do this sort of stuff back in the day. <laughs> so he'd have pillars and columns, which would have, say, like a, a symbol or a color. So that when people were thinking about where the lines were, they'd look at that area and they could recall their lines. Wow. So again, it's a memory palace, what they're using. But with speeches, there's different techniques that we teach. And a lot of it is also the power of focus. But if you even just write down the first letter of every word, just the letter. So right here, mm. if you just imagine learning how to learn is life's most important skill. Yeah. So if you were just to write down L H T L I like that. Would you like me to do that? Yeah, try it. Yep. Okay. Now try and re recall just the. Learning how to learn is life's. Learning how to learn is life, yeah. Life's, yeah, but you didn't write the last one, which is most important skill. Most important skill. Yeah. So, yeah, so you can read just from the first letters. Yeah, learning how to learn is life's most important skill. Which is crazy, right? Mm. So you don't actually need the entire word. So if you're trying to memorize a speech, you can just write down the first letter of every word that you're trying to remember. Mm. 
And then we've also got other frameworks to make it like that on steroids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you can remember 15 minute speeches really, really quickly and really easily. Wow. For those people that think, right, well, this all sounds really, really interesting, but how long is this going to take me to learn? What would you say? I would say two things. Firstly, it doesn't take that long. Secondly, is sometimes you need to take a step back to be able to sprint forward. So when you're on a, if you're on a, a running track, you need to put your leg backwards and then you can run. Sometimes it just takes a little bit of unlearning to be able to learn properly. So when um, you're doing this, you only need 10 to 15 minutes of focus concentration a day, mm. realistically. You don't need an hour, two hours, three hours. You don't need to. I did it because I wanted to get good at teaching it. And I wanted to have every separate reference point that I could find from all the best people in the world so that I could understand it properly for myself so I can help other people and troubleshoot their areas that don't work. So you don't need to spend as much time as I have because I don't think you're going to pursue it as a passion to teach people it. <laughs> but if, you're, if you've got specific memory goals or if you're just trying to learn to read a little bit faster or remember what you're reading, you only need 10, 15 minutes a day. Mm, right. And Okay. Before we, we end the podcast... Um, I just like to to point out that if you don't apply these techniques over and over again because genetically we're not born with the ability to memorize things these are techniques which can help us in everyday life which mm -hmm. if we apply will be successful if we get lazy and we stop applying them and then I meet you for the first time. You tell me your name, Josh, and I don't associate that with something. The likelihood is I've probably forgotten it five minutes later. So at the end of the day, the brain is a deletion device. It's supposed to be effective, not necessarily accurate. So it needs to remember that the lion over there, the lion is a really bad thing, run away. <laughs> it doesn't need to be able to remember how many hairs or fur is on its body or mm. the little dots on the side of its face or something. It doesn't need to be able to remember all those little things. It just needs to remember the feeling. So when it comes to people's names and stuff like that, the brain will only pay attention, uh, sorry, remember what you pay attention to and you'll only pay attention to what you find important. So if you think the names aren't that important to you, then your brain's going to naturally just delete them. Mm. So some people are just really good with names, right? Because they've told their brain that it's important. So there are techniques to be able to learn to get better at remembering names. But even still, you can forget them if it's not important to you, which is the most important thing to remember. It's like when you're learning something, if it's not important to you, you remember it. Okay. Thank you, Josh. Where can people find you? Uh, on Instagram, you can find us at Operation GOAT, which is an acronym for greatest of all time. So you can try and forget that if you'd like to, but good luck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Josh, thank you so much for your time today. And um, yeah, best of luck with everything and really try and get into the school. Yeah, that's, um, we were just in talks about that literally a week ago yeah. and then they all shut down. That <laughs> would be an absolute game changer. Thank yeah. you so much. And thank you to Rove Hotel in Dubai Marina for allowing us to use this amazing space and venue and um, being so hospitable. Thank you so much. Take care. Thanks, Zoe.